perilous. English, the perilous journey. Well, there is nothing perilous about it, though. I was trying to make it uh, light, but there was some uh, precariousness in the course of English history about English language. At the outset, I'd like to say that our interest in English is not due to any particular colonial hangover or uh, due to any particular undue admiration for the English speaking people. It is largely because English language today is more the language of uh, the world community. It has uh, grown a lot. It has traveled a long way from its original origins up to the present time when we are doing this uh, Zoom session uh, on English language learning and teaching. So uh, I, what I'll be doing in this uh, talk is to trace the history of in the perilous journey of English language. <clears throat> well, I begin with the uh, observation that English was not made in England. English language was not born in England. Now, we always think of English as language as the language of England, but interestingly, English was uh, did not originate in England. Uh, so I, you can see the picture of England here. This is England, and this is the continental part. This is the uh, what the ocean, the, the part of Atlantic Ocean called North Sea. And here, this little part is called the English Channel. So English came to these islands or this huge bit of island, the, the big major part of the island from these areas. These areas are Germany, Southern Denmark and Netherlands, modern days. This would be, this Frisian part would be Netherlands and this area would be, and this tip would be Germany and you have Denmark here of modern times. So English had its origins somewhere in these areas and then it came to England and became what we call today English. So English is basically a Germanic language which came to England, came to the British Islands in mid 5th AD by Anglo-Saxon migrants from what is today Germany, South Denmark and Netherlands. This is a fact known to us. And we know that Germanic is a subdivision of Indo-European language families and English, for one thing, was not born in England. And here I've given a closer picture of the, the thing. Yeah, we know that the story of England begins in the continent. Uh, there, um, at that time, in this part of the world, modern United Kingdom, the language was different. We will look at that in a while. The English was not spoken at that time. We are talking about maybe first century, second century, third century AD, uh, maybe uh, uh, some 1,800 years ago, uh, this island did not have English in it. And there was no English at all at that time. English would be, it would evolve later, maybe in the sixth century, seventh century, etc., from a combination of different dialects spoken in these parts. So uh, in, in these parts of uh, Europe at that time, there was a language called West Germanic and people, tri different tribes speaking West Germanic, including Frisians, Saxons, Angles and Jews. They went to different parts of the world, including England and also to other parts of Europe in search of living space. You know, as we always say about language growth, people move out in search of living space. So Angles, Saxons, and Jews were the primary people, the, the major people who came and settled in England. And but who, what was happening in England before they came to England? Here we are interested in three major language families. Uh, I, uh, for, the, for, the, for students, please remember that there is a concept called language families. Um, the language in, uh, in Andhra, which is uh, Telugu, the language in Kannada, which is uh, Karnataka, which is Kannada, the language in Tamil Nadu, which is Tamil, and the language in Kerala, which is Malayalam. All these four languages belong to one family called Dravidian. That means there was one huge community of people speaking a, a proto-Dravidian language from which 
these languages slowly evolved as people moved out and settled in different parts. Languages are always growing. Languages never remain static. So in the process of growth, we find that there are different language families. So in Europe, there were three major language families that we are interested in now. Okay. So these families are one Celtic, the other Roman, and the third Germanic. Roman has other names. You, you, people call it Romance sometimes. We can call it Italic if we want. So those are other names for Roman. And modern day languages like Romanian, Italian, Spanish, French, etc. came from uh, this family. And Kel let, let Celtic be there. And Germanic, we already discussed Germanic. So here you have a picture of a Germanic, uh, it's a reproduction of, a, of Germanic people. Uh, it's a painting. We, we do not know how the Germanic people look like. We, we know about them only from descriptions that we read in different poems and uh, writings of those days. And yes, the or, so the, we, it is believed that the original inhabitants of England were the Celtic people. This, this is an ancient, uh, uh, you know, reproduction of an ancient image of the Celtic people. The Celtic people, again, which was a big family, and a, a branch of it lived in England, and they were called the Britons. So the name Britain came from the Celtic tribe that inhabited the islands long back, maybe uh, until, say, uh, 5th century AD. They are still there. The Celtic people are still there. We'll come to that. And then we have another interesting family of which the, the we have some few Roman soldiers here of long back. So Romance languages, Celtic languages, and Germanic languages are of interest to us when we study English language, English literature, and uh, you know when we closely study the, uh, the the linguistic features of England as students of literature. The, these three are very important. Particularly, Roman languages are very important because uh, England was exposed to uh, French language for quite a long time. And the influence of French is very, very visible even in the English that we speak today. Many problems we have with English spelling, English pronunciation, etc., cetera, have, uh, is because of the association with Romance languages, originally Latin and later French. And uh, yeah, we'll go to the next slide. What I am trying to say in this slide is that three major language families are closely connected in terms of exchanging linguistic influence and uh, cultural influence, Celtic, Roman, and Germanic. Now we'll look at uh, how it worked. Um, okay, so I, I have a bit more to say. Uh, the Celtic people were originally there in England. There might have been people before that, we do not know. As far as uh, history is uh, known to us, the Celtic people were living in the British islands for long when the Romans came. The Romans came uh, around uh, first century, second century AD, after Julius Caesar, the Romans came and they occupied uh, much of the British islands, but they were rulers. They did not displace the English people. They were rulers and they administered the Roman rule in England for a long time. And the, before that, the people who lived were the Celtic people and they, became rather weak over centuries of Roman rule. Celtic people grew weak because they did not have much defenses because their defenses were taken care of by the Roman soldiers. But by about 5th century, 6th century AD, the Romans withdrew. We have heard of the collapse of the Roman Empire, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And gradually, Roman soldiers, the Roman legions, Roman administrators, pulled out of England, they went back to Italy, where they originally belonged. And the Celtic people were taken over by Germanic tribes. So that is very simply, in, in the simplest terms, that is how English happens. So the Germanic of the, Germanic is a big family. We are interested only in West Germanic, uh, and particularly the, the Germanic spoken by Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, who came and settled in uh, England and uh, and their languages blended to, to be known as Old English. And today we speak 
modern english okay so the close neighbors of english are in terms of uh, language english i have a list here swedish danish norwegian icelandic uh, english german netherlandic frisian uh, faroes is also there which is a uh, frisian also they are minor minority languages so these are all germanic languages spoken you can see this is a picture of i i i present maps because we need to have a clear idea of uh, the places we talk about geographically so this is the british islands as we call it and uh, and this area is called england this is called england and you have a little bit here which is wales and the northern part is called scotland and this is ireland ireland is a island so in today in modern days ireland much part of ireland the major part of ireland is an independent country whereas the this a bit is part of what is called united kingdom so united kingdom brings in ireland scotland uh, part of ireland scotland england and wales anyway so the uh, as we said the um, english language came to england from these parts these parts and uh, naturally there will be some relation between the languages spoken in these areas and english but today these difference these similarities are very very uh, invisible because centuries have passed just like tamil and kannada or uh, or telugu and malayalam have grown very different uh, though they were maybe thousands of year, years ago one single language we have moved away from each other and our vocabulary our script our pronunciation everything has changed so that happened with uh, this area also so the the close relatives of english i mentioned uh, are um, french is a very close relative of english maybe english and french would be cousins the language i mean okay so that is to give you an idea of the area geographic area and so as we said um, england has now the old english period i said from uh, from say the 5th century uh, english has established more or less though not um, fully because england was still occupied in parts by the celtic people and there were different tribes belong to different uh, dialects of english like like the um, the angles were there the jews were there the frisians were there so they all speak spoke different varieties but gradually they were all blending together and we generally refer to that period uh, say early 5th century onwards we refer to that period as old english period so old english would sound today to our ears to our eyes old english would look like and sound like a very different and foreign language so i was i have uh, titled uh, my my talk um, uh, the, you know the perilous journey and i have mentioned perilous because english uh, the journey of english has been not not has not been very smooth england uh, language developed in england it grew and it was forming itself but then it faced many linguistic threats so this peril is not physical damage to the people it is linguistic threat to the language it, it, there was a threat at, there was such immense threats at times that it looked as if english was going to totally disappear well uh, the first peril i would say uh, you should you should take my word peril with qualification came with christianity coming into england now we must remember england was ruled by the romans soon after christianity began to spread in europe so naturally when the roman uh, rulers converted themselves into christianity including constantine constantine uh, christianity was established in england as well by the french by the roman soldiers and the roman legions who were in uh, england had established christianity but the anglo saxons and jutes who came later and destroyed much of the culture of the celtic people they were not christians they had other gods they worship they had other systems of worship so by the year no, we have given this year by when king ethelbert ruled england in the 6th century england did not have much christian presence in it though in the uh, in in some parts there was 
uh, Christianity was very much there in Europe, particularly in French, uh, in French provinces in Spain, etc. Christianity was widely in vogue at that time. But in English island, Christianity came in a big way during the reign of King Ethelbert. He uh, look at the picture of the king here. It's not, it's not a, a picture, it's a bronze statue of the king. And you can see a structure behind in the background, which is the Cathedral of Canterbury, which is the Cathedral of Canterbury. And in the neighborhood, there is also a huge monastery. The ruins of the monastery are visible in the neighborhood. That is an old story, which, is, uh, which I'd like to tell you. So King Ethelbert was the king of England uh, from 550 to 1660. And he was married, he was what maybe uh, in uh, Christian terms, he was a heathen in the, in the sense that he was not Christian. He was an Anglo-Saxon king. And he, uh, he was married to Bertha, a European lady, and she was a Christian woman. So he had a soft corner towards Christianity because his wife was already a Christian. And interestingly, in, in the neighborhood where the statue is, there is a small church called St. Martin's Church, which is uh, very, very old. It's something like 2,500 years old because in, it, it was built during the Roman times. And it was it, um, Ethelbert converted it into a church for his wife. And it is the oldest church in England where service continuously going on. So even today in that little church, people uh, congregate and they have services. And if you go to that church, you will see a small door which is sealed up on a side, which was a door through which uh, King Ethelbert's wife, Bertha, went into worship. So that, is, that was a background where St. Augustine came to England. St. Augustine, who, who was, who became a saint later, Augustine, he was a, he was a monk. So he came from Rome. He, was, he, was, he spoke uh, the Latin language at that time. And he came to England and with the permission of King Ethelbert, established himself in this church called St. Martin. Later, gradually, uh, a monastery grew up. And St. Augustine is today remembered as the first Archbishop of England. The Archbishop of England is always called the Archbishop of Canterbury, though his seat is not today, he's not in Canterbury. So Canterbury is a place in England which is very rather near France, though the a little bit of ocean is there. Strategically, historically, Canterbury is very, very important. Um, yeah, to literature people, we, we hear about the murder in the cathedral and the and the and the uh, the journey of the pilgrims in Canterbury Tales. So Canterbury is part of our imagination all the time. So here is King Ethelbert and the arrival of Christianity into England. Now, what, what is special about the arrival of Christianity? Christianity brought in Latin to, again to England. Latin was there and then it was wiped out by Anglo-Saxons and Latin came back to England in a big way. So as just as Old English was growing and developing, you have a strong influence of Latin coming into England through uh, Christianity. And the first threat to English came in the form of Latin, but it was there and English went on surviving. And then you had, after a couple of centuries, another major threat to English language coming in. It was not always, a, this threat was not only to English language, it was also a threat to the English speaking community, the Anglo Saxons and Jews, and which was from the Vikings. We have always heard of Vikings. Here is a picture, that, a photograph of a man. Uh, this is not really a Viking. He is a modern actor who is, uh, you know, who is who has dressed up like a Viking, standing before a museum in the city of York. The city of York in England is very important because there, there's a lot of archaeological evidence, several layers of the Celtic civilization, the Roman civilization, and then the strong presence of Vikings or Norsemen in England. And the Vikings are also called Scandinavians. So you would have heard of Scandinavian influence in English language. So they are called Norsemen or people from the north. All these names are there. And Vikings are very important. Vikings, who were the Vikings? Vikings were also Germanic people. So we have heard of Angles, Saxons, and Jews. Vikings also had different tribes. And Vikings was a common name they applied to all these different tribes. And they were also a kind of Germanic people. They were North, they belonged to the North Germanic branch of the language. So they also spoke a similar language at that time. So today in English, 
In the second uh, major influx of an, uh, another language, Scandinavian presence is very strong in English even today. And that happened to, through the Viking series of Viking invasions that happened uh, in the sixth, seventh, eighth uh, centuries. It began uh, as early as maybe seventh century and went on till 10th century. So, Viking, second pedal from Vikings. And here, this is an image uh, of the England. This is a map of England during the Viking time. So about uh, 1020 AD, how England would have looked like. So th this is the North Sea, North Sea. And the Vikings mostly came from these uh, places. In, in, from attack came from this country. You have, I've written Yorvik here. You see that Yorvik, Yorvik is the land of the Vikings. Uh, and they, in fact, uh, came to England and occupied many, many parts of England at that point of time. So we had the Anglo-Saxons being slowly subjugated by the Vikings at one point. That there was a cultural and linguistic subjugation of the Anglo-Saxons by the Vikings at a point of time. That was another peril that the English language faced in its history. And in the, when we talk about Viking and in the, uh, uh, when we talk about the history of English language, it's very important to think of King Alfred. He is called King Alfred the Great of England. Not many English kings are remembered as great. So King Alfred is remembered as King Alfred the Great. And that you, you, you might remember another king, King Arthur. But remember that King Arthur was a legendary kind of person. He was a Celtic king. King Arthur and King Lear, for that matter, were Celtic kings. They were uh, they are believed to have lived, lived and ruled in England before the Anglo-Saxons and Jews came. They are, so they are, technically they are not English people. King Arthur was not English, he was Celtic. Though Arthurian legends became very popular among English people in the, in the Middle Ages. So King Alfred and King Arthur are entirely two different people. So I am saying it in case you confuse. We have King Alfred, but he is a documented person. He Historically, he existed and we have a lot of uh, in information about him, though we do not know where he is uh, buried. That is not known. But long, long time ago, all these things happened quite a long time back. Um, yeah. So King Alfred uh, is remembered today for two things. One, for, for, the, for his engagement with the Vikings and also for his immense contribution to the English language. Perhaps if King Alfred did not live and uh, rule and contribute to language, English language would, would not have had this much Englishness in it. By Englishness, I mean uh, uh, the, the remnants of old English. We would have had, um, uh, maybe English would have been replaced by French language. So he had a major, very, very important role to play in, 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 in the history of English language. So the, I, I was saying that uh, the Vikings were creating a lot of problem in England and they were they had begun their attack from the north and then they were moving southwards. Let, let, let us take a look again. We must remember that this area here, this area is Wessex. You have Wessex, not, not fully. This part is called Wessex and this area is called Kent. And modern days, Kent, uh, Canterbury would be somewhere here. And the place called Dover is also somewhere in Kent. And as we go north, you have... Northumbria, you have a river here called Humber. Uh, yeah, Humber River is here, sorry. Humber is here, just above Yorvik. And the part above Humber is called Northumbria. So Northumbria, um, this part is called Mercia. And all these, uh, here, here is Mercia, and this is, uh, you know, Anglia. All these parts were, in, these are ancient names, were totally occupied by the invading uh, Vikings, and they were uh, a lot of lang linguistic influence was also happening at that time. And King Alfred was the ruler of Wessex, but he, even though he lived, he ruled from Wessex. He uh, th there was already a union <coughs> between all these countries, and there, uh, long back a heptarchy was established, and already there was a notion of England. And he ruled over all these areas, and he won a major victory over the. York, uh, over the Vikings in the Battle of Eddington in 878. That's a historically uh, a very important event, both in English history and history of English language. The Battle of Eddington, in which the King Alfred was able to win a major victory over the 
Vikings. He did not say, kick them all out. That was not possible. He entered into a treaty with them, at a, the treat, which is called Treaty of Wetmore. Uh, I have written a name here, Guthrum. Guthrum doesn't sound English. It's a he's a Scandinavian name. He's the name of a Viking ruler. You have the famous picture of Guthrum uh, bowing down before King Alfred uh, after the Battle of Eddington. Battle of Eddington is believed to have been a very bloody battle with so many people killed and the streams flowing red with the blood of the people uh, killed in the battle. And you have Guthrum, who was the leader, who was defeated and he uh, submitted before uh, Alfred. And Alfred, being a wise king, uh, entered into a treaty with the Vikings and some kind of peace was established, which in fact continued. So that was a major achievement. And an area uh, was allotted to the Vikings later on. It, was, it came to be called Dane Law inside England. So that is Alfred's uh, uh, achievement in terms of uh, you know, establishing peace with the Vikings. But his, today he's remembered also. And one thing we need to remember is the Vikings were very destructive in their, uh, in their behavior. Just like the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes were very destructive when they came to England originally. In, in the fourth, fifth century. The Vikings were also destructive. They, they, they vandalized things, uh, vandalized buildings. They destroyed libraries. They destroyed churches. They burned, uh, you know, burned down whole villages. And the word vandal today came from the name of a Viking tribe. That's very interesting. We today call about vandalizing. And vandals were a, a, a North Germanic tribe of people belonging broadly uh, into the, in the category of Vikings. So they vandalized a lot. And in fact, many, many books which were written and kept in, in scrolls and manuscripts were destroyed by the Vikings during their long invasions. King Alfred uh, was able to preserve many of these in, in England, in Wessex, in his libraries, which he controlled. And he translated many works that were written in other languages, particularly in other dialects. For example, that was a big contribution of Alfred. He patronized, he commissioned the creation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. He um, translated many major works from Latin into English and also had many works preserved for future generations. Big contribution to English language. But towards the uh, end of the Old English period, after uh, uh, Alfred the, the Great died, there was changes happening in English language even within, particularly due to changes in time, changes in lifetime as that civilization, that culture grew. And also due to the influence of the Scandinavians, Scandinavians, Vikings, Old North, all same influence. So when a, 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 a land, land is occupied by another group of people speaking a different language, even though these languages belong to the same family, a lot of changes will happen in the language particularly in, in grammar, uh, in, in vocabulary, in pronunciation, in all aspects of the language, changes will happen. So uh, the Scandinavian, due to Scandinavian influence, due to, uh, and, and natural causes, Old English was changing uh, at that time. And there was a considerable reduction of inflections. Old, what is inflection is word endings. Uh, uh, the Germanic language and its mother, uh, Indo-European, were highly inflected languages, just like Indian languages are, just like Sanskrit or Hindi, and even our uh, the Southern Indian dialects, uh, languages, all are highly inflected. But English depends a lot on uh, in grammatical words. We don't have, inflect means have grammatical endings, have grammatical endings. Uh, I, I can't give examples in Malayalam because there are other speakers as well. Um, well, but we won't spend much time on that. We will just say that there was a big reduction of inflections. That means English became easier than uh, other Germanic languages at that time. There was a kind of leveling of inflections. Uh, and historically, after Alfred, uh, there was an array of weak kings. And there was a time when the Scandinavians ruled England. There was a king called King Canu, who is, again, a, a semi-legend kind of person who came after Alfred, he was a Scandinavian ruler of England. He is also called the Great. So uh, Anglo-Saxon would mean English. That means belonging to one of those tribes which came and settled in England or, it, and, and, or the, the future generations of them. So, so you remember, in, already we have in England, Celtic presence, Roman presence, Anglo-Saxon presence, 
and also Scandinavian presence. So in, in English language has many features today. We say that English language is difficult because of this, because of singularity in pronunciation. We have problem in spelling. All these you, you will understand better when we look back at the history of English. Why? What happened to English language over all these perilous uh, times? So the kings were weak after Alfred, and then finally there was a king called William the Conf uh, Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor was a very pious king. He was perhaps the last but one Anglo-Saxon king who ruled peacefully for a while. So let's remember Edward the Confessor. He did not have children. So when he died, his relative Harold Godwinson, remembered in history as King Harold II, became the ruler of England in 1066. Now we have looked at English history from its beginnings until 1066, which is the 11th century. And the Roman period, after the Roman period, and after the coming of English people in England, say 600 years or less than that, is called Old English period. And now we are moving out of Old English period. And the historic event that marks this shift is uh, what I'm dealing with right now. So Edward the Confessor, the King of England, Anglo-Saxon King, he died. And he was followed by Harold Godwinson. Harold Godwinson was not the direct uh, heir of um, Edward. Th there were two other people who believed they had a claim to the English throne. One was Harold Hardrada. He was a Scandinavian. He was a Viking king living in Europe. In, in the, in the, you remember the picture I showed you of uh, Denmark, etc. He was living somewhere there. Harold Hardrada. He believed he had a claim over the English throne. And then another gentleman named William of Normandy. He was living in France, part of France. He also believed he had a claim over the English throne. So first, uh, soon after, Harold settled down as the king of England. Harold Hadrada attacked England and King Harold was able to defeat him at the Battle of Stamford Bridge on the 25th of September, 1066. Look at these dates because everything happened in a very short period of time. Ha uh, Hadrada was defeated. That was a Viking. The final attempt of the Vikings to take over England was uh, foiled and he was killed in the battle. But as the battle was going on, you had another thing happening. William of Normandy landed in England uh, with a reasonably large army, and then a battle ensued. And finally, on 14 October 19, 1066, at the Battle of Hastings, Harold II was killed. It's a, a big historic event in English history. Harold II being killed in the Battle of Hastings. So the importance is that Harold II was the last Anglo-Saxon king. So that marks the end of what is called the um, Old English period, the death of Harold at Hastings. Um, here I have for you the picture of a tapestry. A tapestry is a long uh, uh, embroidered thing. It's about 60 meters long. And you can see the width here, but it is too long to uh, see on, on screen. Uh, this, this is called the Bayou Tapestry. It's called the Bayou Tapestry. And the Bayou Tapestry is still there and it is in display in um, a museum in France. And this was created at that time. And it, sh it shows the, the Norman invasion, what happened before that and what happened during the Norman invasion and what happened immediately after. Is embro it's like, it's a very important historic document, the Bayou Tapestry. And you, here you have, uh, this person is Harold. So it, it, uh, if you look very carefully, there is an arrow here. And it, the, it is believed that in the war, he was killed by an arrow that went into his eye. So this is historic for English uh, uh, language uh, students and for the learners of uh, European history and literature, this is an interesting document, the Bayou Tapestry. Well, after that, what happened was there was a, there was a total change, there was total chaos because England was taken over systematically and completely by a foreign ruler. So again, I said, remember the three families, Celtic family, Roman family, and the Germanic family. At present here, you have Germanic people living in England, and they were attacked by Vikings. They were also German. But now you have, and Latin is there, that is Roman language. And here, you have another variety of Latin coming in. 
a, a very a language that evolved from Latin much later, which, which is a Norman French. So the French language came into England, and from about 1100 to 1500, this is the third period. Uh, England, the English language is nearly wiped out of England, but it survived. That is another interesting thing. But English language changed drastically, immensely during the uh, Middle English period. This is the Middle English period after the conquest of England by William uh, uh, of Normandy. He came to be known as William the First of England, and the English changed immensely. And because the the whole uh, aristocracy was replaced by uh, French lords and uh, ladies, and uh, you know this is an interesting example. Uh, English language in, uh, and uh, simply thousands and thousands of words came to English language from French. They, they were borrowed as such. So even today you have many words. For example, words ending in O-I-R, as in reservoir. So we, we say a reservoir, a, a dam where water is collected. It is, or a person with a lot of information, we say he is a reservoir. It's a reservoir. And G-A-R-A-G-E -A -A -E is pronounced garage in English, but it, the, it, you know, we tend to pronounce it as garage, but it is garage because it's a French loan word. And in French language, they would pronounce it somewhat like age, A-G-E is age. For example, the, the French equivalent of courage would have been courage. So you see the sh sound. So that sh sound uh, probably uh, came in England from French. So you have that big leap happening. This is relevant in modern days as well. We have problem with many English words where the pronunciation is different. The other day, uh, we were discussing about how G-E-N-R-E -E is pronounced. G-E-N-R-E, -E, whether it is to be pronounced as genre or genre or whatever. G-E-N-R-E -E is a French word. And in, in, in French, it would be pronounced, the R sound in French is very tricky. It's very different from English sound. It is, it is articulated somewhere inside your mouth. It is similar to the ha sound. For example, example the French word M-E-R-C-I, M-E-R-C-I, which means, you know, thank you, mercy, mercy, is mercy. That's the sound happens somewhere inside. I do not know French, so I, can, I can't articulate it well. It is something like mercy. So G-E-N-R-E would be, in French, it would be somewhat like genre. So in modern English, we cannot pronounce it as genre because we don't know the hara sound, which is in French. So the approximate thing would be genre. So this problem we have, we have a regular problem with English pronunciation. And, and the result, reason is that everything, all, all, all this confusion happened during this particular period I'm talking about, 1100 to 1500, when many English words were spelt in a French manner. Many French words came into English, and the English people themselves probably did not, did not know the pronunciation. Interestingly, remember, we may have problem with genre when we see it for the first time. Believe me, an English person who hasn't heard that word will also have the problem. He or she wouldn't know how it's pronounced unless he refers to a dictionary. So we don't have to feel bad that our pronunciation is not that good, because English pronunciation is not uh, you know, in, in concordance with its spelling. Therefore, we have to learn it afresh. It's a natural thing. So that is another topic. But I was telling you, drawing your attention to the fact that all that began, particularly during this big mix, as I have called it, during 1100 to 1500. And here is an interesting thing. This, what, these words here, pig, cow, sheep, these are all English, old English words, Anglo-Saxon words. And when the because uh, in England, the, 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 after the Norman invasion, the English people were doing all the work. And the Romans were living in their palaces and mansions, and they were enjoying the fruits of the labor of the English people. So the deer were hunted by the ordinary person. The pigs were reared and killed and cooked by the ordinary person. Cow or ox were cooked and uh, reared and cooked by ordinary person. Sheep were grown by ordinary person. But the food was eaten by the French lords. The words venison, which means a meat of deer, pork and bacon, which are different meats of uh, pig, beef, meat of cow or ox, sheep, uh, the meat of sheep is mutton. Mutton, beef, pork, bacon, venison are all French words. So this is an, a common example, which we always say about the impact of French, French I mean, the French uh, conquest, not French conquest, Norman conquest, 
uh, Norman fringe was slightly different from the fringe that was spoken in Paris and other parts at that time, but we can say it is more or less French influence. And these, these words are all from Norman French. And uh, a, a large number of English words today related to administration, law, banking, um, at a rule, church, etc., all came from our borrowings from French. So this was a time when hundreds and thousands of English words were lost. Anglo-Saxon words were lost and they were replaced with French words like chivalry related to Chaka, French word falcon, uh, the name of the bird falconry was a big uh, thing among the lords of those times. The word justice and dozens and thousands of words are all of English have been borrowed as such from French, but the spelling might have been changed a bit. Pronunciation might must have got anglicized, as I said, uh, both. Uh, some are kind of uh, neither here nor there, no, but some have totally French pronunciation even today. So uh, the word exchequer has another story. You know, exchequer, the word exchequer came from the fact that a uh, king had his, uh, his lords, uh, you know, he would levy tax on them. And the tax money would be arranged on a checkered uh, clock so that, you know, you have different colored boxes and the money will be kept so that the counting is easy. And that is how the word exchequer came. A uh, little, little bit of vocabulary there. So we are now in the Middle English period. So in the Middle English period, we have two important people who uh, had a very uh, significant role to play in English history and those were Chaucer. Uh, I'm not spending much time on Chaucer. This is a page of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Chaucer died in 1400 and printing came to England only in uh, about 76 years after that. In, he died in 1400 and uh, printing came to England full swing in 1476. And this was one of the first pages that ever was printed in England. It was printed by William Caxton. So I've uh, brought this here. here. Um, this slide is um, here for the reason that William Caxton had a very important role in English literary and linguistic history. History, like King Alfred did, he also trans. He he started. He established the printing press in England. That is one momentous event, very historically important event. Though printing was, um, you know, there was printing in different parts of the world. In China, they they had printing technology. We are talking about Europe. In Europe. Printing was brought in by John Gutenberg, as we know, and the first book to be printed was the Bible, Gutenberg's Bible. The translation that he did, did uh, from, uh, uh, yeah, not he did, uh, the, trans the, the German translation of the Bible, which is called Gutenberg's Bible. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, in England, uh, printing was brought in by William Caxton, and his contribution is that he uh, translated many works into English. In fact, the first book to be printed in England was uh, this Requiem of the Histories of Troy. Requiem means collection of uh, stories from Trojan War, uh, published in 1470. This was printed in Europe, but the work was done by William Caxton. That was actually the first book to be printed in English language, 1473. And later, the printing press was set in England, uh, three years later, and the book, uh, first book, perhaps one of the earliest books, and perhaps the very first book to be printed was Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. The importance is that English language was beginning to come back as a major language in England. That's a very important thing. Yeah, in, in this, even in, in 15th century, in the early 15th century, Chaucer was born, uh, 14th century, I mean, Chaucer was born in early 14th century, maybe 1340 or something. We do not know exactly when he was born. Uh, he was born during the reign of Edward III. And Edward III was, you know, in the line from William I, Conqueror, 1066, many, many generations have passed. But even in 14, uh, in, in 1340, uh, 1345, when Edward III was ruling England, he belonged to this Norman French lineage. He also spoke French largely. So after that, you had Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V. Gradually, we see that, in, you know, Shakespeare has documented these uh, also. We see that English is coming, so becoming more and more predominant. And the contact of the, the French kings in England began to decrease. They had French provinces as well. They were all mostly lost. And finally, the French, the kings of the French line also began to marry 
uh, uh, people from England and the, the noblemen began to marry French nobility, marrying uh, ladies from England and English language was the mix was going on. And finally, out of this mixture, out of this cauldron of uh, mixing, English language emerged afresh. And that credit goes a lot to Chaucer and Caxton. And in uh, 1485, uh, some uh, nine years after the printing press was established, uh, we had the Tudor ascendancy in England. In 1485, uh, the Tudor monarch named King Henry VII became the ruler of England. Not the gentleman in the picture here. Uh, this is a different person. King Henry VII became the ruler of England. And from then on, you had uh, maybe the, 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 the peril of that English language uh, faced from foreign invasions, foreign linguistic influence, etc., was resolved. And from that time onwards, there was stability in England and also a, a, a great creative flowering uh, began to happen. And after Henry VII, you had this gentleman. He is Henry VIII, very famous king who married uh, six times. He divorced a few and a few died. And uh, you know, finally, he, his uh, last wife, Catherine, uh, there were he, he, three of his wives had the name Catherine. And the last Catherine outlived him. Yeah. So this is King Henry VIII. And I am com coming historically to another event. This picture here on the right side is a ruin. And some of you might uh, remember that this is the Tintern Abbey, as it looks today. Tintern Abbey. Shakespeare, Wordsworth has written a poem, Tintern Abbey lines, which are very, very famous. And this is the Tintern Abbey. And the Tintern Abbey looks very funny. It doesn't have a roof. It has nothing. It's a, it's a you know, Tintern Abbey, even the place where Wordsworth visited was very similar. Much changes had not happened. Tintern Abbey was in ruins when, uh, when William Wordsworth visited it and he was inspired to write the lines. So Tinter, how, what happened at Tintern Abbey? Not only Tintern Abbey, that you will find in England hundreds of churches like this, which are in ruins, which they preserve and keep. And these, this, this destruction, everything happened during the reign of Henry VIII. Henry VIII had a problem with the Pope, the Catholic Church, because he wanted divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. He wanted to marry a lady named Anne Boleyn, uh, but the church did not allow. So he broke with the church and he established a church of his own, which is Anglican church, the Protestant English church. And he sent his soldiers on a rampage and they went all over England and plundered all the monasteries and brought all the wealth to the royal coffers. Well, that is something he did. Its importance is that he became wealthy, partly because the, the royal coffers became wealthy, partly because of the plunder that was going on. He was followed by his daughter Elizabeth. There were uh, 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 two other monarchs in between, but very short period. He was followed by Elizabeth I, who also developed a large navy, a very efficient navy, and England became a strong power under um, Elizabeth I. The, the background was created by her grandfather, Henry VII, and her father, Henry VIII. And remember, Elizabeth was the daughter of um, Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn, whom he married after divorcing his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. And uh, you, you might be curious to know what happened to Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn had her head cut off. King Henry uh, did not like her after a couple of years from marriage and he had her head cut off and he married a third person, third woman, and her name was Jane Seymour, which is another story. Okay, so we'll come to the next slide. Now, why I talked about Henry VIII and the Navy, etc., is that with the naval force, with the uh, building of big ships, English language could move out of England. So now the journey ends and another kind of journey begins which is also perilous, where the English people began to move to other countries, colonizing, plundering, uh, looting, etc. It's said that the word loot is of Indian origin, and that is one of the uh, uh, words that came into English. So when they, uh, many countries at that time did that. The English did that, the Dutch did that, the French did that, the Portuguese did that, the Spaniards did that. They had naval power and they went to different parts of the world and plundered them. And English people came to, in to India and they established East India Company in 1600. Those who are interested in history will be curious to know that Elizabeth I and Akbar of England, India ruled in the almost similar years. Elizabeth came to power in 58 and died in 1603. 
and Akbar came uh, to the throne, the Mughal Emperor. At that time, Mughal Empire was reasonably big and much of Northern and Central India were under the Mughal rule. And Akbar uh, came into, uh, on the throne in 1556 and he, he died in 1605 or he left the throne. Uh, and his kingship ended in 1605. So similar years. I think most, both of them, uh, their period ended with their deaths. And Elizabeth surely was queen until she died. Well, uh, um, well uh, it can be said notionally that East India Company was established with the permission of Elizabeth. And you know, with the, uh, we are not sure if Akbar knew about it. But uh, the East India Com though the East India Company was formed with the signature of Elizabeth or the sanction of Elizabeth in 1600, it became fully established only some time back, later, maybe around 1612, when Akbar was no longer ruling. The af after Akbar, uh, like Jahangir, etc., later on, the, uh, the, there were weaker monarchs, and East India Company could bargain and they could kind of uh, cheat and gain more land in England. We know all those stories. So East India Company ruled from 1612 to 1757, and then uh, you know they were they did not rule; they were present in India at that time, and they began to rule the much large parts of India. Not India; it's historically wrong to say they ruled India because uh, geographically today the nation India was not there at that time. And uh, by India at that time, we mean Afghanistan, we mean uh, Sri Lanka, we mean Pakistan, we mean and all those Burma, all those area were all under. Uh, one umbrella at that time. East India Company was not ruling India alone. Much, much many other neighboring countries were also under their control. And the company rule in India, we believe is, um, we know is from 1757 to 1858. And from 1858, we call the British Raj when the, after the, uh, the Sepoy mutiny or the first war of independence in, in India, uh, the, in, the, the Queen directly began to rule England. At that time it was Victoria. And uh, we had the Viceroy in India ruling. Anyway, so why did I talk about this? Because to, to trace the evolution, uh, the English coming to India in early 17th century, growing rapidly, and we are sitting here today talking in English. The legacy. English moves out of England and it, it reaches India. And around the same time, the Pilgrim Fathers landed in 1620. The Pilgrim Fathers were English people. And this is a picture of the English people being welcomed by the natives of America. And uh, I have quoted some lines from uh, uh, The Tempest, which was written some uh, 15 years or so before this incident happened. And it, it kind of uh, foresees what happened in America at that time. These are the words of Caliban, where, the Cali where Caliban says, um, complains that Prospero came to this island. And this island was mine and I was peacefully living here. Prospero came and I showed him all the secrets of the island and I welcomed him. So the image of uh, Caliban can be seen in these people and Prospero in these people. It is as if Shakespeare foresaw what was going to happen. And, and they, they, these people welcomed the, the English people and they showed them where, the, where water was and what was good to eat. It was, a, it was a totally new geographical area with totally new animals and plants and they, all those these things were learned. Uh, but what happened after they had settled was, uh, I wouldn't say it is all a planned thing, the story of a huge uh, carnage and the, 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 the native, we all know that, the native uh, Amer Americans, the native Indians of America were nearly totally wiped out and you know, you know the history, the bitter history. So th this is a story of colonization in, 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 in every part of the world. In India, it was in a different shape. That's all. We, they could not wipe us out because we were more advanced by the time the English people and the Dutch people and the French people came to England, India. I mean, India. India was already, we had, though India as a huge nation called India was not there, different pockets. We were, we, we had advanced systems of rule here and that's why they did not destroy, but they, uh, you know, managed things in a different way. Well, these lines, I will, I'll just read and leave. Uh, the words of Caliban about his little island, which is now controlled by Prospero. I must eat my dinner, the island is mine, which thou takest from me. When thou first came, thou strokes me and made much of me, would gives me water with berries in it, that is uh, uh, coffee. Teach me how to name the light, bigger light, that is the sun, and how the less, which is the moon, that burn by day and night, it means, Prospero gave Caliban language to speak. Uh, that is his language. Probably Caliban had its language, but 
Prospero gave him his language, just as the English people gave the colonies English. And the, col the people of the colonies began to write back to the English people using that very same language. And then I loved thee and showed thee all the qualities of the island, the fresh springs, brine place, barren place, etc. We know the story. Now, I was just incidentally bringing it in to show that story of colonization. India was not totally colonized as the English people did to the USA, America. America was sparsely uh, populated and the people did not have much resistance, so they could kind of totally replace uh, and establish an English uh, nation there. But in India, it was a different kind of story because we already were thick, uh, had a very advanced civilization in India at that time. Uh, compared to uh, the US uh, situation, American situation. And then English uh, people moved to Australia in, in the 1800th century. You had James Cook ma uh, making his voyages to England, to Australia, chartering, charting much of Australia, many regions. And finally, uh, the English people established a penal colony in 1788, which is, uh, uh, they began to, uh, you know, send uh, prisoners to that island. We know the story. And that is how Australia also became an English-speaking country. India did not become an English-speaking country, but uh, English became a strong presence in India. And uh, I think I, I may need to conclude, but I'll go quickly. Here is the concept of Englishes. Today, we, we say that English is not one language. We say that English is different languages. English, there are Englishes, many types of English, just like Anglo-Saxons and Jews spoke different dialects. English has developed different dialects. And, in, um, in the, gen the, the Indian-born scholar, Braj B. Kachru, he talks about three circles. The inner circle, where the, 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 which is where English is the first language or mother tongue, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, USA, UK, West Indies, where English is the mother tongue. And you have the outer circle, where, uh, and then you uh, where English is second language, I'll define what second language is, and also uh, the expanding circle where English is foreign language. So here in a circle, English is first language. First language we, is mother tongue. So English, uh, uh, we say that Malayalam is my L1, my first language. So that is my mother tongue. Um, and the outer circle today would be in second language uh, situation. So like India, English is not foreign to us. There is a strong English presence. So we say English is our second language. So in the outer circle, English is second language. In the expanding circle, which is ever widening, which is, uh, it is um, English is foreign language. For example, in Japan or Korea or Russia, they have all their learning in their own language, but, and, and no English there. But now they are learning quite a lot of English because English is a major language in the world, the language of the internet, language of business, etc. So they learn English, their mother, they, they learn everything else in, in, in their mother tongue, their technology, their their medical science, everything is in their language, but they learn English for international communication only. So we say that is an EFL situation. So outer circle is where English is more, the English presence is much strong. There can be movement, uh, for example, Singapore might move from outer circle to the inner circle soon because Singapore is becoming predominantly English speaking. Right? I'm just introducing these three circles to you. And um, today, coming to modern days, this is early 20th century. The, the, if the screenshot is from the movie, uh, My Fair Lady, based on George Bernard Shaw's novel, Pygmalion. It's about English language. So I'm trying to talk about the major varieties of English and the concept of standard English. Uh, today we have uh, many varieties of English, as I said. So these lines, look at her, a prisoner of the gutter, condemned by every syllable she utters. By right, she should be taken out and hung for the cold-blooded murder of the English tongue. Here you have Professor Higgins, the specialist of English, who represents perhaps Bernard Shaw's views, talking about this flower girl who speaks a very uh, unrefined English, and he says she should be hanged because she speaks, a very, she speaks bad English. So that was the attitude in the early 20th century, among the scholars. I mean. So we, we talk about modernism in the early century where everybody complained that the world has become fragmented. In the same way, English was becoming, you know, all, the, the, all over the colonies people began to speak and English was being spoken in different ways. 
not in the way they spoke in the in the, in the universities or in the in the schools in london people were speaking english in many ways across the world and this view was there initially that there should be a standard english and uh, you know bernard shaw was very keen on that but the fact is that that is not possible it is never going to be possible so our aim is also not to speak a standard english that is not going to be accept the varieties of english is very important 